So we're going to get right into the message, and uh, that means that when I'm done, we're done. And so if that means we get done early, then we get done early, and if not, then um, then we don't. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Psalms. I'm, I'm not going to be in Proverbs tonight. We're going to look at Psalm 3. This is one of my favorite... Uh, <laughs> Yes, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, I know. Uh, but it is. Uh, it really is. Uh, uh, the Lord has used this to uh, to be a, a blessing and encouragement to me over the years. Uh, and really what Psalm 3 teaches us is that discouragement depends on your point of view. It depends on your point of view. It's easy in this world to get discouraged. But if we take a step back, we can find out that the reason we got discouraged is because of where we were looking. And this psalm actually lays out every bit of that for us. It's very, I, I think it would be very helpful for us tonight. Verse number one, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Uh, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. And let's pray. Father, we are thankful for each one who's here tonight. We're thankful for uh, just the privilege of being able to look into your word. I pray that you would uh, speak to hearts, that you would challenge us and encourage us uh, with what your word teaches. And I pray that it would be a help, that it would be a blessing uh, to each one of us to uh, consider uh, where we are looking and, and uh, what has our attention. And Lord, I pray for your will to be done now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So here, it, it's it's interesting that there are three different points of view that the psalmist, David, it says, uh, lays out. Now, if you look, if your Bible has like the little snippet at the top of Psalm 3, it says, a psalm of David... Uh, when he fled from Absalom, his son. So that gives us a bit of the context of what's going on. Uh, David, yes, he has uh, he's failed in that he fell into sin with Bathsheba. We know that. Uh, and then he uh, went on to uh, have Uriah killed. Uh, and, and he later confessed that to God and God forgave him of those things. Nonetheless, God said, there's going to be trouble with your family. And this really is a part of that trouble uh, that was the judgment on his sin. Now, uh, that's not to say it was God's will for David to be overthrown uh, in the end. And, and we see that uh, in, in the text. However, in the moment, can you imagine if it was Absalom being the oldest of his sons? Can you imagine the oldest sibling going after dad, saying, I'm going to take him out because I want his position? How discouraging do you think that would be? I mean, it's bad enough when, you know, just people on the job or people, you know, neighbors or whatever uh, don't like us. But when it's your own family that they're out to get you, that's discouraging. And, and certainly I, I'm sure that David had bouts of discouragement where uh, he didn't know what to do. And that's how he begins. Lord, how are they increased? That trouble me. Now he's talking about uh, Absalom specifically, but he's talking about more than Absalom. Because uh, the scripture tells us about Absalom that he had stolen the hearts of all Israel. So how are they increased that trouble me? These people that are opposed to me, these people who are against me, they're numerous. And it, it seems like everywhere I look, more and more are cropping up. 
And certainly we can feel that way as, as we face and, and look at the problem and we have uh, really what, uh, what we're going to call a horizontal view. We're just looking out this way. This is what we're seeing, just what, what's out in front of us. And we see, oh, this person's against me. We look over here. This person's against me. We look over here. This person's against me. How are they increased that trouble me? And then he goes on to say, many are they that rise up against me. Now that actually is a little bit different. Uh, that that uh, rise up has to do with um, the idea of a wall or a fortification. So we understand uh, what a fortification is. It, it's something that people can hide behind for defense. And so that's what, that's what that is. So you have people who are against me, and then you have other people who rise up. In other words, they get up in the way to defend those who are against me. You know, they're usually the ones who say, oh, I'm not going to take sides. Uh, it doesn't, you know, I, I just, I have, I have, um, you know, no, no, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to put this together. Uh, you know, I don't have a dog in this fight. I was going to say a dog in this race, but I don't <laughs> care for dog racing. So I don't have a dog in this fight or I don't have a horse in the race. I was trying to say both at the same time. And, uh, and yet then they'll turn around. I don't have a dog in this fight, but I can see their point of view. I can see where what you did would have hurt their feelings or what you did would have turned out badly. And I can, and so what does it end up being? Are they neutral? No, they're not. They're not necessarily on the offensive against us. It's just that they're always defending the ones who are against us. And if that's what we're looking at, guess what we're going to end up with? Discouragement. Every time we're going to end up being discouraged. In fact, uh, as you as you go on in verse two, many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. As Absalom came marching into Jerusalem, David had run out the back door as Absalom was coming in the front, and so it looked like god had taken his hand off of david it looked like god was done using david there's no help for him in god uh, if if you remember i can't remember the the gentleman's name but uh, he was of the lineage of saul and he came out against david and he's throwing stones at him and he's cursing him as he goes along and you bloody man essentially saying you're getting exactly what you deserve but what he's saying is exactly what the psalmist is saying here. There's no help for you in God. God can't even help you. You're getting what you deserve. You, you're getting exactly what you have worked for. And so there's that, that horizontal view of there's one, those against us. Two, there's those who are defending those against us. And then three, there are those who are whispering in our ear. There's no use. You may as well give up. You may as well quit. You may as well stop trying. And then he ends with this word at the end of verse 2, which is the word selah. And that word simply means think about it. Think about that first point of view. How's that going to work for you? You know, how is, what, what's that going to end up with? Obviously, we know that is going to end up with discouragement. Yet, because we are in these carnal fleshly bodies we are so tempted to always look at the horizontal look at the problem out in front of us and look at oh there's no answer to this there's no way we can circumvent this there's no way we can surmount this there is uh we're, we're done we're defeated at this point there's nothing else we can do think about that that's exactly what happens with that point of view. But when we get to verse 3, then David begins talking about a different point of view, and that is the vertical point of view, obviously, uh, in uh, verse 3 and 4. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. So now he begins to turn his attention away from the problems that are all around him. And he begins to look up. Now, we would look at that and say, that's 
foolish because the attack is going to come from here. So you better be looking out here so that you can defend yourself. But David got it right. He needed to look up to the Lord. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And, and that's exactly what he's doing. But thou, O Lord, you, it's, it's you. It's, it's not all these people that are rising up, uh, that, that are my enemies. It's not all these people that are rising up to defend them. It's not all these people that are whispering in my ear and telling me that there's no hope and I may as well give up. It's you. Thou, O Lord, and, and look what it says about the Lord. Thou art a shield for me. You see, those people that are against us, they may have people rising up in the way to defend them, but somebody's going to get hurt. But when the Lord is our shield, what do we have to worry about? Amen. We are defended. And it's, it's a... It's an amazing thing. He, he says, thou art a shield for me. And then he goes on to say, my glory. Some people glory in their strength. In fact, the scripture tells us that, uh, that the young man's strength is his glory. Uh, and some people glory in that. Some people glory in their possessions or in their income or their position in life or in society. Uh, they, that is their glory. But David says, no... Not only are you the one who is my shield, the one who is defending me, you are the one who is valuable. Amen. You're my glory. You're the one that, that I'm not willing to give up anything for. You know, we, we all have some things, uh, sentimental things uh, that, that we've had. I'm not, I don't tend to be really sentimental. I'm really good about every three or four years just getting the trash bag and scraping everything into a trash bag and taking it out to the dump. I'm really good about that. And then later saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, I've, I've done that before. But I do have uh, in, in, in my office at, at the house, I have a little pocket New Testament that my dad bought for me when I was in kindergarten. I still have that. And that that is... A treasure to me. That is something, it doesn't get scraped off in the garbage can. I mean, there's a lot of other things that do. But that is not going to get scraped off into the garbage can because that is something special. My dad went away on a trip. He was preaching at uh, the church that my granddad pastored. And when he came back, he brought that to me as a gift. And I have never forgotten that. And I've always cherished that, and I and I still have it hidden away so nobody else will throw it in the trash either. Um, because I raised three boys to be like me, to one degree or another. And so that is something that is valuable to me. But how much more valuable is the Lord? Consider what, I mean, we, we've talked about this before over the last several weeks, but consider who He is. He's the Creator. And yet, being the creator, he considered you and I, he considered our lost condition, and he loved us when there was nothing to love about any of us. If we can look at that and, and still say, oh, my glory is in my stuff, or whatever the case might be, uh, then, you know, God help us. Because the Lord ought to be our glory. We ought to recognize Him as our glory. And then, I love how David puts this. He says that the Lord is the lifter up of my head. Now, I like to visualize things. I, that's, that's just how I'm made. I like to visualize things. And, and a lot of times, people can describe things to me and I'm like, Oh yeah, oh, that sounds really nice. And then when I see this, like, that's not at all what, what I thought they were talking about. I have to visualize things. And so, but when, when David says of the Lord that he is the lifter up of mine head, it gives me the idea, or it makes me think of Peter as he was walking on the water to go to Jesus. And as he began walking on the water, what did he do? He began looking horizontally, didn't he? He began looking at the wind and at the waves, just all this out here. He wasn't looking to the Lord anymore. And what happened? He began to sink. 
And then the Lord said, or rather Peter said, Lord, save me. And the Lord saved him. Now, I don't know how far Peter had sunk into the water, but I know that when you start sinking in the water, it's usually pretty quick. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, and, and so it just gives me the idea that just his head's above water. You know, and sometimes we feel like uh, with the situation, people are against us, and then those who we thought would be our friends are actually defending them, and then other people are whispering, you may as well give up, you may as well quit, and, and all of that is going on, and we feel like we're about to go under. I can't handle this. This is too much for me. And David says, Lord, you're the lifter up of my head. You're the one who comes and kind of grabs us here. You know, under under the jaw, just holds us up, where we don't sink, we don't go under. And yes, we may feel like we're about to, but we don't, because he's the lifter up of my head. That that's such a totally different point of view, isn't it? But uh, look at look at verse four. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and He heard me out of His holy hill, Selah. So. Now, uh, once, once there's a recognition of who God is, of what God is, and what God is going to do for us, then there is the obvious outcome. The obvious outcome is, I'm going to call on the Lord. That's right. That's just like salvation. You know, it, it, it's, it's like when, when you realize... That your sin makes you uh, makes you unworthy before God, and you have no help and no hope in and of yourself. And you recognize that, and then you recognize the fact that Christ has done it all. If we will simply put our faith in Him, what is the response to that? It's exactly what Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13 tells us. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I realized I was lost and I realized that Christ was my only hope. It really, when, when I finally surrendered to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Nobody had this hold a gun to my head and say, all right, you need to call on the Lord. Nobody had to do that. That was, that was a legitimate outpouring of my own heart. To God, recognizing who I was and what Christ had done for me. But it's the same thing when we come to any circumstance, any situation in life. It looks like there's no hope, there's no help, there's nothing I can do. And then we turn around and we realize the Lord, Jehovah God, the eternal self-existent one. He may be eternal, he may be self-existent, he doesn't need me, but... He wants to help me. He'll be my shield. He'll be my glory. He'll be the lifter up of my head. And when we see that, what does it draw from us? It draws a cry. Lord, help. You're the only one who can help me. You're the only one who can make a difference. Do you see the difference between those two points of view? The one, you look around and say, yeah, uh, people are whispering in my ear and saying there's no hope for him in God. They're right. And yet, when our, our, our perspective or our point of view is changed, and all of a sudden, it's not, oh, they're right, I have no hope. It's, I do have hope, and I'm going to call on the Lord. Because He is, He is my help, He's my shield, my glory, the lifter up of mine head. And you notice He ends this verse again with the word Selah. Think about it. Think about the difference. There is a vast difference between these two. Remember, David is running from Absalom when he wrote this. This is not after the fact. He is running from Absalom when he writes this. I can understand the first two verses, but most of us would have a hard time writing those third and fourth verses. We'd be stuck back there in the first two, looking around at the horizontal instead of looking to the Lord. But the third thing that David does here in the rest of this psalm is he deals with the blessing of having the right point of view. 
So let's let's look at this. In verse 5. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. You know, there are two things that people do when they get discouraged. They get depressed. There's two things. On the one side, there are people who uh, go to bed and can't get up. They just stay in bed. Oh, I'm depressed. I can't get out of bed. I just can't face it. Then there are the others who can't go to bed. They're up walking the floors all night, back and forth. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how this is going to work out. And yet, what is the blessing of looking to the Lord? I laid me down and slept. So when it's time to go to bed, I don't have a a big problem there. And then he says uh, that uh, I await. So when it's time to get up and go about my business, I can get up and go about my business. That's not to say that we are, are totally oblivious to what's going on. That's, that's not true. That's why we call on the Lord, isn't it? Because we recognize, hey, there's still things going on here. There's still people against me. There are still people whispering in my ear telling me that there's no hope. And so uh, he, he points out that blessing, the blessing Asleep. In fact, the scripture tells us that he blesses his, uh, his people with sleep. Verse number six, he says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Now, instead of looking around, oh, I can't believe how many people are against me. Now there's a difference because he changed his perspective. Now it's a a perspective or it's a stand, a blessing of courage. I'm not going to be afraid. All these people are against me. Fine. Let them be against me. Fine. Whatever. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stay faithful to God. I'm going to continue to do that which is pleasing to God. I will not be afraid, he says. Then in verse 7, he says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. This is an interesting thing. Now, again, this is David calling on the Lord. Lord, arise. But you notice how how this works. And we talked about this on Sunday. I am no uh, grammar expert by any means. Uh, but notice he says, arise, O Lord, save me. That is present tense, right? That's right now. Arise, O Lord, save me. But then you look at that next phrase. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. That's past tense. You realize what he's saying. Lord, arise and save me. But I realize, Lord, you're already working on this. I may be praying about it now. But you already are working on it. You know, when when we have a... A uh, vertical point of view where we're looking to the Lord instead of looking at the circumstances or the people or whatever uh, the case might be. We don't see what God's doing. Sometimes we see the end result of what God's done in the end, but we do not see God working. We don't see how God is going to bring victory. We don't see that, how God's going to bring us through that trial or that situation that we're in. We don't see that. But David is talking by faith. Arise, O Lord, save me. (coughs) I'm calling on you to save me, but I know you're already working. You're already bringing things to pass. I don't see it now. But it's happening because you're God and you can work on all these things. I don't have to see it. I just know by faith that God's doing that. You see that blessing? How encouraging is that to realize that when we're calling on the Lord, God's already working. He's already working on our behalf. Then in verse 8, he finishes up by saying, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Now the word salvation <clears throat> does not always refer to the salvation of the soul. The forgiveness of sin and being made right with God. Salvation is uh, synonymous, especially in the Psalms. It's synonymous with the word 
deliverance. So now he's still talking about the situation. He's still talking about the circumstances. Because it's still there. Just because he's looking to the Lord doesn't mean that everything's gone. But he's recognizing where deliverance is going to come from. You know what some of us do? uh, we're, We're guilty of seeing, I mean, we're looking out this way. And then we say, Lord, you need to do something. And then we go and try to figure out how we're going to take care of it. How we're going to deal with the problem. And we need to recognize the blessing of looking to the Lord. And that blessing is that He's going to deliver. If He's already working, then He's going to deliver. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to wonder about how it's going to turn out. He will deliver. Salvation belongeth to the Lord. We should never try to take deliverance from the hand of God and create our own deliverance. Because all we do in that case is, number one, we make ourselves discouraged because we can't do it. And number two, we make ourselves tired because we just work ourselves to the bone trying to make things happen and it's never going to work like that. So you notice how he ends again? He ends with that same word, sila. Think about that. Not only is there a difference between the, the uh, horizontal view and the vertical view, looking at the, the circumstances and looking to the Lord, but there are blessings to looking to the Lord that cannot be enumerated, that cannot be compared to what happens when we try and deal with things ourselves. When we just look out at the circumstances and give up. Well, that's no blessing. It's not a blessing to God or man. And so it, it's, uh, it, it's, to me, one of the most encouraging psalms in, in, in uh, all the book of Psalms. One of the most encouraging passages of scripture in all the scripture. Because it, yes, it points out we can, we can choose to look at all of these things. We can do that. But that's going to end up with discouragement. We can look to the Lord. That will end up with encouragement. But it ends up with these other blessings as well. We do not want to miss out on those things. And so it's important for us. Because we all face things. It's important to us to check. What's my point of view? What am I looking at? Am I looking at the problem? Am I looking at the people? Am I looking at the circumstances? Or am I looking to the Lord waiting for deliverance from Him? And letting Him bring in His blessings that will buoy us and strengthen us through whatever that situation and circumstance is. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed in